He was the man who for seven decades walked with the Queen, accompanying, supporting and loving the most famous woman in the world. And he was just perfect for the country at the time, perfect for the Queen. It must have been a special marriage. His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, was the longest serving royal consort in British history. He shared a lot of the difficult times with the Queen in, in a way that no one else could. As a partner in the most high profile of marriages, his character influenced the evolution of the British monarchy. He wasn't part of the great social set of England at that time, and so he was a breath of fresh air. A fascinating, complex man, Prince Philip was the foreign-born noble who overcame tragedy before earning his place at the very heart of the British establishment. He had a, an astonishingly difficult childhood, one which would have daunted, I think, anyone else, frankly. He was the all-action sailor who served Britain with distinction during the Second World War. It was always said by naval officers that he would have gone to the top of the Navy and he would have done it on his own merit. Before sacrificing personal ambitions in service to royal duty. He gave up everything for his wife, and there are not many men in this world who would do that. If Her Majesty became the epitome of unbroken discretion and calm, Prince Philip was, by comparison, larger than life. <laughs> and a man of strong opinions. It remains to be seen whether those in political authority can shoulder their responsibilities in time. He enjoyed getting things done, and getting things done means being outspoken. Free thinking and direct, the Duke of Edinburgh most certainly was, but ultimately, he was also the husband, whose devotion to his wife and to his adopted nation allowed her reign to be long and successful. He has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. Prince Philip, as consort to the Queen, came to represent all things British. However, the man himself was famously, of course, not British born. Prince Philip was officially born as a prince of Greece and Denmark, um, but the Greek royal family actually had no Greek blood whatsoever because a Danish prince, his grandfather, had been uh, sent down there in 1863 to become king of Greece, and his mother was a Battenberg, um, so she actually was a uh, great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria, born at Windsor Castle in 1885. It was a tumultuous time in Greek history, with the life of his father under threat following a military revolt, the infant Prince Philip was whisked to safety in a British warship as the family began years of exile across Europe. In later life, Buckingham Palace would become his official residence. But during those childhood years, Prince Philip would live at various times in France, Germany, and across Britain. When people asked him later on in life, um, you know, what, what language did you speak at home, for example? What language did you speak at home? He, he, he would sort of shoot back very sort of furiously and say, what do you mean at home? Because essentially he didn't really have a home. Philip was the youngest of five children and the only boy. As well as dealing with their life in exile, the marriage of his parents soon ended, his father effectively abandoning the family, his mother suffering a nervous breakdown, which meant the young Philip would be cared for by an English guardian. He once said to me, um, my father was away, my mother was ill, I just had to get on with it. And that was very much his attitude all through life. Prince Philip's family may have been royal, but after fleeing Greece had little wealth, and were almost entirely dependent upon the generosity of their relatives. And it was those relatives who funded Philip's education. 
In post-war Britain, a lot of people were poor, but Prince Philip in particular was poor, and this was very striking in these circles in which it was aristocracy, whose wealth went back for generations, who had huge amounts of land, gigantic houses, who saw themselves as Britain's rich aristocracy. Prince Philip, a man with nothing, nothing really more than what went in his suitcase, he was completely different, an impoverished young man. He turned up at Balmoral to go grouse shooting. He famously went out shooting in his grey flannel trousers, and that's all he had. I mean, and I think there was something very refreshing about the fact that he, you know, while a lot of courtiers would have looked down their nose at this, you know, Prince Philip was, a, he, there was a sort of unstuffiness about him and a sort of confidence that he could do this. He didn't feel that just because he was at Balmoral, he had to go out. He probably couldn't have afforded it anyway, but go out and buy a pair of plus fours, you know. He would go with what he had to hand, which was, a, a, you know, a pair of grey flannel trousers. Of course, no royal courtship could progress without the permission of the king, which, after some consideration, was forthcoming. I think King George VI uh, admired Prince Philip very much. I think his only real concern was that, you know, that, that uh, Princess Elizabeth, Princess Margaret, you know, hadn't had much of a well, childhood and adolescence, and then all this happened um, very quickly at the end of the war. And, you know, the princess was very young, and I think he just wanted to have a little bit more time with her to be absolutely certain she was doing the right thing. And now a British subject, King George awarded Philip the title Duke of Edinburgh. He was able to marry Princess Elizabeth in 1947. Of them, however posed the photographs were, they were clearly a young couple who were so in love with each other, a very handsome young couple. And for the public, the idea of a love match and their beloved princess being in love was so exciting to them. People after the war were desperate for some good news. There were grim times in 1947, austerity, post-war difficulties, and it was Winston Churchill who called their wedding in November 1947 a flash of colour on the hard road we have to travel. And I think that's how people saw it, a lovely party-ish occasion. The years immediately following the royal wedding were among the happiest the couple would ever enjoy. As well as the birth of their first two children, Charles and Anne, Prince Philip continued his naval career with Princess Elizabeth happy to support her husband. 1947 to 1952 uh, were by and large a very happy time for the young couple, particularly when they were out in Malta where Prince Philip was stationed. and. Uh, Princess Elizabeth could drive her own car, she could go to the cinema, she could go to polo matches, she could go and um, go dancing in the hotel and um, lead the life of a young naval officer's wife. I mean, just, just has the Queen said that the Malta was the main place in the Commonwealth that she could consider to be home other than Britain. However, one cloud in the life of the royal couple steadily darkened during this otherwise relatively carefree period. The health of King George VI began to decline, so much so that Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip began to assume some of his public duties. In February 1952, while the couple were touring Africa in this capacity, King George died in his sleep. At a stroke, both their lives changed forever. There they were out in Kenya, and the Queen was sitting in a treetops lodge watching animals at, at dawn at the watering hole when her father died at Sandringham in Norfolk in the early hours of the morning. And she didn't know. And then she came back to find Prince Philip very upset, telling her what had happened. And when he was told by his aide the aide described him as looking as though half the world had fallen on him. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become Queen Elizabeth II. As well as the personal family loss, 
the prince was immediately aware that his naval career was effectively over, as he was now consort to the queen. I think he would have contemplated 20 years which they could lead their own lives. And during that time, undoubtedly, his ambitions were um, concentrated on the Navy, and he, 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 he might well have gone a long way. The worst thing that happened to Prince Philip in the course of his uh, adult life uh, really was the early death of the king um, because he wanted to prove himself in the navy and it was always said by naval officers that he would have gone to the top of the navy as did his uncle Lord Mountbatten and as did his grandfather Prince Louis of Battenberg and he would have done it on his own merit. The Crown of England, the Archbishop performs the simple yet the most significant ceremony of the Queen's coronation. The coronation of Elizabeth II would take place the following year, in June 1953, an event watched by some 20 million people across the nation. The defining day of Prince Philip's life was the coronation, because until then, they'd lived pretty much as a wealthy but normal couple in the 40s and 50s. Now it is different. He is the consort. He is the consort to this great queen, to this major queen, and his job now is to support her and to support the role. And that's, I think, quite difficult for any man at that period of time. We're talking about the time of the 50s housewife when it was all about the woman supporting the man. Difficult for any man, but particularly different for a man like Prince Philip, who's been a leader, who's been what we would say was an alpha male, a leader, an alpha male, a commander, and now his job is to support his wife. The Duke of Edinburgh comes to vow lifelong allegiance to his queen. The Archbishop of Canterbury, he was all for keeping Prince Philip sort of out of the main part of the service as much as possible, and uh, the Queen was equally as determined to bring him in as much as possible. When Elizabeth had become Queen, Prince Philip expected, as was customary. Within the family domain, Prince Philip's function was head of the household. But in the public arena, as consort to the Queen, no role had been clearly defined for him it would be up to the Duke of Edinburgh to carve it out. Prince Philip was somebody who was a bit of a workaholic, if, all, if everything should be known. He was a, full of ideas, full of energy. Um, I think it was quite difficult for the Queen and the courtiers to actually know what to do with him. In response to this challenge, Prince Philip decided he could use his influence to champion areas of life often overlooked at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clearly our duty as citizens to see that science is used for the benefit of mankind. For what use is science if man does not survive? British technology, science and industry were early beneficiaries, but the range of issues Prince Philip would come to engage with was impressive, illustrating from the outset he was a progressive campaigner well ahead of his time. Sir. Totally useless for a lot of well-meaning people to wring their hands in conference and to point out the dangers of pollution or destruction of the country countryside if no one is willing or capable of taking any action. Well, sir, time is fast running out, and it remains to be seen whether those in political authority can shoulder their responsibilities in time and act quickly enough to relieve a situation which grows more serious every day. Prince Philip started banging on about the environment, about fossil fuels being, being in short supply, oil running out, and he was talking about the environment in the 50s, but in the 50s, nobody took any notice because nobody knew anything about the environment. Nobody knew what the environment was. They just thought, oh, well, the environment is the air, the air's fine, we're breathing it, we're all alive, hey, hey, you know, we'll just carry on living. On a whirlwind tour, Prince Philip arrives in Cameroon to raise the world's awareness of the need to stop rainforests like this vanishing completely. Conservation was a key issue for Prince Philip, and he was named president of the Worldwide Fund for Nature International in 1981. 
The appointment caused some controversy, as the Duke was a keen shooter, having once even hunted a tiger in India. It was a time when you went on tiger shoots, presumably those no, days. I never went on tiger shoots. I went on one shoot. Not a thing that was... shot there. one tiger that happened to be lame at the time, anyway. And I imagined you weren't even born then, anyway, so I don't want to know about it. Alongside his work in conservation, in 1956, he founded the Duke of Edinburgh's Award, the self-improvement program for young people, which would eventually become one of his greatest legacies. His sincere desire to help the next generation make the most of their lives was evident from the outset. This scheme is not a, a cure, uh, it's a preventative. Once you've got a soccer hooligan, you've got a soccer hooligan, and somebody else is going to have to try and cure him of that. The, the purpose of the scheme, basically, is to try and catch people while they are moderately civilised still and keep them that way. I have a feeling the reason why the Duke created the Duke of Edinburgh Awards was to make sure that there were people who were left behind were always thought about, given opportunities. Because once you give a child or a young person opportunity to prove themselves, they flourish. And that's what the Duke of Edinburgh Awards is all about. So how would you sum up the sort of the identical young person you might meet? I mean, are, they, are they enthusiastic? Are they lazy? Are they inquiring? There's some of all. Yeah, I don't think you want to generalise about young people. It's very dangerous. <laughs> but there's no sense you have that they're less willing to take risks nowadays? You know, that we hear this I think it's a great danger about people generalising about young people because you can find somebody who's the exception, or not just somebody, but a whole group of them who are exceptions. During his life, Prince Philip was actively involved with hundreds of charities and organisations. One of his strengths as an advocate was his willingness to speak his mind on a range of topics, while often writing his own speeches as well. Prince Philip could had a little bit more room for manoeuvre. He still had to support the Queen's neutrality, but he could encourage discussion and reach conclusions that um, perhaps allowed people to say and do what they thought. With Prince Philip writing his own speeches made those around him, his staff, his secretariat, a little bit nervous because they were never ever terribly sure what he was going to say until he delivered it. He was one of those people who tend to, uh, to play close to his chest and he'd never pass the, uh, the speech around uh, for others to see and others to vet it. He knew very well that he had to steer off politics but there was a way of delivering a message that might have a political overtone uh, and delivered in such a way that it didn't rock the boat. However, Prince Philip's frankness could take his audience by surprise on occasion, as it did in 1969 while in Canada, where he seemed to suggest Canadians could sever ties with the monarchy, if so inclined. I believe that it's part of the structure of our society, and particularly in this country and the United Kingdom. I think it's valid, but it is for the purpose of the community here, and, and this is how it should develop. If uh, there is a consensus of opinion that it's outlived its uh, value, well, then let's come to an amicable agreement about it. Not, not it's really, we should be beyond the point where we have to have a, well, a revolution or something about these things. He enjoyed speaking out, he enjoyed getting things done, and getting things done means being outspoken at times. He was a man who was ahead of his time. When you think of all the things he campaigned for, the environment, food, looking after the world, you know, if you're ahead of your time, sometimes you're misunderstood, and I think that's what probably happened on many, many occasions to the Duke of Edinburgh. In later life, and to his dismay, Prince Philip's comments would come to define him in the imagination of some. They were not talking about his work, they were talking about his gaffes. He was very conscious that he'd become gaff man, and it annoyed him, he hated it. As he said to me, you know, uh, when the queen comes into a room, she is the queen, and people respect that, she is the event. When I come into the room, well, I go down endless lines shaking hands, and I do at least try to make one person in the lineup laugh. 
The prince's latest gaffe was made as he accompanied the Queen's visit to an Aboriginal cultural centre. The palace leapt to his defence today, reportedly claiming that his comments were meant in good humour. I remember once in uh, Brisbane and uh, there were some Aboriginal elders and uh, he came up to them after the Queen met them and he came second, of course, as always. Uh, but he said, oh, he said, um, I've just met your other tribe up the, up the road there. He said, are you still chucking spears at each other? And they all laughed. And of course, when it was reported the next day, it looked awful for him. He was very angry about that because the other tribe he visited earlier had told him that we used to go to war with them and we used to throw spears at each other because he thought that was tremendously funny. Some of the gaffes he shouldn't have said, uh, some of them he didn't say, and they've just become urban myths. But when he said those sort of comments, for instance, the, the slitty eye comment uh, in China, the fuse box which looked as if it had been put in by an Indian, I don't believe he was saying that out of nastiness. I do remember once at a private dinner party, there were perhaps a dozen men around the table, all of whom knew the Duke well, and a friend of mine and a friend of his, more his generation than mine, began telling a joke that was clearly going to have some sort of racial subtext to it. And the Duke of Edinburgh, though this was a private occasion, stopped him and said, I don't think we like that kind of humour here. I think he was just saying comments, like many people of his generation said, just trying to break the ice. In the presence of the monarch, which tends to silence people rather a lot, even sometimes people of enormous capability and experience get totally tongue-tied in front of the Queen for some reason. Uh, but with Prince Philip, his sort of easy way with a joke really did break the ice. And uh, walking, for example, onto a factory floor, onto some great occasion with hundreds of people there, just that little remark, you know, and uh, people laughing, even if they hadn't heard the joke a little further down in the room, just sort of warmed up the occasion in, in the best possible way. The guns were deafeningly close, and Prince Philip's amusement may well have been caused by the discomfort of the assembled photographers. If ever he saw he was on a foreign tour, he saw there was a British news crew going to be accompanying it, his heart sank, because he knew all they would be looking for was the gaff. And he said, I also know that the tour will not be reported at all unless there is a gaff. That sense of frustration led to a sometimes fractious relationship with sections of the media. Prince Philip's views of the, uh, the British tabloid press were always pretty hard. Um, he didn't like them, he didn't like any of them. There was an occasion I, I remember so well when a reporter from a tabloid tried to be friendly, I suppose. Um, it was at a press reception. I can't even remember which country it was, but said, um, how was your flight, sir? And Prince Philip said, have you ever flown? And the reporter said, yes. He well, it was just like that. In a way, if you're presented with all these things and all those things, you, you know more or less that if you're going to say something, it's going to be taken down. But if you're having a conversation and, and somebody pokes one of these at you with a tape recorder behind or one of those long listening devices which they can overhear a conversation 20 yards away, you, you get a bit anxious. He resented uh, the media, uh, and that's because in the 50s and 60s he tried to work with the media. He, he was the person who brought television in, and he tried to build a constructive relationship. He felt that was just thrown back in his face. You suggested to a chap with one of these things how he might dispose of it. Well, <laughs> <in private control. laughs> I, <clears throat> I, I'm glad that he took it down. I hope he did it. Uh, <laughs> The relationship between monarchy and media would become further strained during 1992, with some press reports criticising the cost to the public purse of repairing the fire-damaged Windsor Castle. What rankled him, I think, about the press was the, the, the constant drip, drip feed, um, certainly in the 1980s and the 1990s, constantly having a, a go, constantly having a snipe at the royal family, constantly having a go at royal family finances. But there is every sign that it was the public outcry over the Queen's finances which followed the Windsor fire and with the Queen herself under criticism from some MPs apparently making no gesture towards the cost of repairs which has brought forward the announcement which the palace, the treasury and the inland revenue have been piecing together. Headlines are also dominated by reports of the breakdown of three royal marriages. 
The Queen was getting blamed left, right and centre by the media of not being able to control her family, which was a bit, which was a bit rich, suggesting that the Queen should be able to control her family, control their marriages. There's nothing that she could do about it. These are adult people. And if the marriage goes pear-shaped, then that's it. Nothing she can do about it. But she did have the support of Prince Philip. She was able to talk to him. He was a comfort to her. He was al he'd always been a comfort to her, right from the day that they got married on the 20th of November, 1947. Without doubt, the most damaging incident was the separation of Prince Charles and Diana, Princess of Wales. For his part, Prince Philip was criticised by sections of the tabloid press for being cold towards his daughter-in-law. And I think he was sometimes portrayed as, for example, being very critical of um, the Princess of Wales, of Princess Diana. But in fact, it, although I haven't seen those letters, but uh, he, he wrote to her quite often in the, in the 80s and early 90s and, and was compassionate in the sense, look, I know what it's like. I came into the royal family as a, as a, as a foreigner and as someone outside um, you know, the British royal tradition. And I know acceptance is difficult and the media attention is difficult. And I think his, his attitude was a lot more sympathetic than he's good, given credit for from outside. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to help that um, marriage. And I think he was very sad about it because I think he hoped very much that they could resolve the situation because he knew it would be damaging um, not only to them personally, which it undoubtedly was, but to this institution of monarchy, and therefore to, to his wife. In their first official announcement, detectives investigating Saturday's fatal crash have said the driver of the limousine in which the Princess of Wales and Dodie Fayed were travelling had been drinking that night. The amount of alcohol in his blood well above the legal limit. If the monarchy had felt under attack in 1992, five years later, in August 1997, the death of Diana in Paris would precipitate the fiercest criticism they had ever faced. As head of the royal household, Prince Philip would help steer them through this dark hour. Prince Philip was a tremendous support to both William and Harry, as was the Queen. Uh, they were up at Balmoral when William and Harry were there. Prince Charles was there with them, their dad. And this was a tremendous shock to everybody. And what needed to be done was to help and counsel William and Harry to come to terms with the tragedy that had happened to their mother uh, before they had to return to London. And there was a lot of vicious press reporting uh, aimed specifically at the Queen and Prince Philip for not being in London, particularly the Queen for not being in London uh, at, at the time of the build-up to the funeral, not considering for a moment that William and Harry needed their grandparents and needed their father, needed to be shielded uh, from everybody. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered. With the royal family back in the nation's capital, behind closed doors, Prince Philip would help guide his grandsons through perhaps the most difficult event of their lives. Emerging from St. James's Palace, Duke of Edinburgh. Age was to walk behind the coffin of your uh, parent, and William, understandably, wasn't sure whether he could do that. Now, it wasn't protocol for Philip to walk behind the coffin of uh, his daughter-in-law, but he said to William, if I walk, will you walk with me? And any footage that anybody looks at today or tomorrow or any time in the future, they will see Prince Philip gesticulating in conversation with William all the way along the processional route pinpointing landmarks to take his mind not only off the tens of thousands of people lining the route, but the millions watching global television. A reassuring pat on the back of Prince William from his grandfather. There's a moment where they pass under the arch uh, coming through um, Whitehall and going down towards the Abbey. 
And knowing that at that point, or thinking at that time, point, that no cameras were on him, you can see him turn and speak very gently to William, as a grandfather would do. A moment of immense privacy in the, men, in the midst of the most traumatic and public of events. The idea of Prince Philip, the famously outspoken, often gruff consort, as a gentle grandfather may have surprised many. But perhaps that's because the Duke of Edinburgh kept that aspect of his character largely beyond public view. In private, according to friends such as religious scholar and conservation campaigner Martin Palmer, his warmer, spiritual side was more evident. He had um, a strong but quizzical religious faith. He loved to ask questions. He loved to tease clergy of any tradition and denomination. But he also loved to hear different ideas of our place in the cosmos, our place in the universe. What were we here for? I think his religious quest was always to understand why has God put us here? What are our responsibilities and duties? And how can we best fulfill those in order to be truly instruments of God? I once had a conversation with him about spiritual matters, and he began talking in a most intriguing way about the connection between faith and the environment, between nature and science, and you know, asking questions about what is God, what is God's purpose. And he saw me taking notes. He said, oh, you know, I'm gonna write about that. I mean, start writing about that, I think I'm a fruitcake. He didn't want that spoken about. Prince Philip's religious beliefs may have been largely a private matter, but his lifelong passion for sport was there for everybody to see. He was a true man of action from childhood right through till old age. Very competitive, yeah, in it to win it, uh, whether it was uh, sailing or polo. In fact, he uh, broke his arm playing polo and the Queen banned him from playing uh, polo. This was when he was in his 50s. So he did listen to the Queen, his wife, but he then took up, uh, I think, an equally dangerous sport, which is carriage driving, which you see how fast those carriages go around turns and up and down hills. Uh, they have some pretty big crashes. He was instrumental in writing the rules for the international competition. So it was largely down to him that it became recognized as an international sport. As he took a sharp left turn, the Duke was thrown. His two grooms also took a tumble. Both the referee who was on the carriage and the grooms ran to his assistance, but the Duke was not hurt. He scrambled back into the driving seat, minus his hat, and took over the reins again. The Duke was never really interested in horse racing. He much preferred to watch the cricket. But of course, when the Queen uh, had a runner, or he'd pick the horse in the sweepstake, he would be out on the balcony. And this was a close run thing. I think the Queen's horse was in the final three. It was in the derby and, she, and it, was, it was really going for it. And the Duke really let go, you know. I never seen him like that before. Uh, and he just was screaming the horse home like everybody else was. But I just think it's just a, a lovely picture where he was willing it across the line. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't win, but <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a great picture and one I, one I treasure. As well as becoming Britain's longest serving consort to a reigning monarch, Prince Philip was also the oldest ever male member of the British royal family. I can only assume that it is largely due to the accumulation of toasts to my health over the years that I'm still enjoying them. <laughs> it's a very satisfactory state of health and have reached such an unexpectedly great age. Prince Philip had remarkable energy levels. When he celebrated his 90th birthday in 2011, he stated that he would, understandably, begin to wind down his workload. But in keeping with his character, that didn't seem to happen. 
We were told every year that Philip was going to be scaling back his duties, but it really didn't appear that way. He was still uh, really busy and not doddery at all. I mean, you wouldn't have thought he was his great age. Uh, you would have thought he was, he was 10 years younger than that, but he uh, was still very busy doing his own things, but also uh, supporting the Queen. This is a man who was a, a workaholic who, who, who basically wanted to live every waking hour and try to learn new things in every one. However, even this most resilient of men suffered several health scares in later life, the most high profile in 2012 during the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Poor weather during the river pageant caused Prince Philip to become ill and then hospitalised with an infection forcing him to miss some of the subsequent celebrations. At the service at St Paul's, the uh, Queen was going up the uh, staircase at uh, the cathedral on her own, and suddenly she looked really alone. You looked at those pictures and you thought, something's wrong here, what's missing? And of course, what was missing was the person, the one person who's been by her side for more than 60 years. I think just a good rest is probably required. Uh, mind you, I think... Yes, inevitably, I think, so uh, absolutely. And we were all... He's been watching it all on television, so, so... Prince Philip would recover, but perhaps his absence had spurred some to reflect on the prospect of losing him one day. Now that day has come, what insights do we have about the real Duke of Edinburgh? He would admit he was irascible and uh, didn't suffer fools gladly, but... He was a complicated guy. He was also very funny. The Queen and the Duke certainly do seem particularly at ease here. It was the Duke himself who decided that they should spend the actual day of their anniversary on Malta for this very private of public couples. Quite a romantic gesture. <laughs> the first time I met the Duke of Edinburgh was at a luncheon and I was asked to sit next to him. And they told me he was only going to be there for half an hour. He came and he spoke to the person on his right for 25 minutes. Then he suddenly turned to me and said, so tell me, who are you and what do you do? And I said to him, I'll tell you what, my love, you tell me who you are and what you do, and I'll tell you all about myself which he thought was hilarious. And we got on so well because I stood up to him. <laughs> Prince Philip was a stickler for accuracy. The details mattered to him. I'd written a biography of him for one of his charities. I, I put somewhere in the book that during the Second World War, Prince Philip had served on uh, HMS Ramillies. He said, I didn't serve on HMS Ramillies. I said, you did sir. You gave me the logbook. I know who served on HMS Ramillies. He said, I did not serve on HMS Ramillies. I said, excuse me, sir, you provided the logbooks, I've seen the photographs, you served on HMS Ramillies. He said, I did not serve on HMS Ramillies, I served in HMS Ramillies. You don't live on a ship, do you? You live in a ship. You don't live on your house, you live in your house. You don't know anything, do you? I mean, I do remember that I gave him a uh, Prince Philip, um, having been a sailor, was interested in naval history. And there's a, a book about uh, Jack. It's a very, very big book. And I gave it to him uh, after discussing it with him once at Sandringham, and he said he hadn't read it, so I sent it to him. And I mean, a week later, I got a sort of four page handwritten letter, which was a sort of tremendous critique of the book. He was immensely assiduous and, and had beautiful manners. Um, and he was wonderful. I remember at the time of the um, commemoration of the, uh, of the 40th anniversary of the Second World War, he was being interviewed by um, a television team about his own contribution. The interviewer asked him, you know, well, what did it feel like? You were being fired upon and uh, you were there in a huge naval battle during the Second World War. What did it feel like? And uh, was it very frightening? He said, well, you just got on with the job. And then afterwards, 
You know, there weren't counsellors around saying, look, do you feel all right? Are you OK? Are you going to be able to manage? You just got on with the job, you know. And immediately that was picked up by the press saying, this is very unfeeling and all the rest of it. And I remember thinking, actually, that's the man. You know, he just gets on with it. The caricature of Prince Philip, as you know, the sort of, sort of idiotic headlines of bluff, foot in the mouth, was so far and away from the truth of the figure that he was. I don't think I've ever seen a better looking, more amazing and more extraordinary man than Prince Philip. He was a truly exceptional human being. Few knew Prince Philip better than his firstborn son, Prince Charles who at one point during his own adulthood had been critical of his upbringing. That in turn had fed into a public perception of a difficult relationship between father and son, consort and future king. Prince Philip is a product of his, was a product entirely of his generation. He served in the war, he had a, an astonishingly difficult childhood, one which would have daunted, I think, anyone else, frankly. He grew up in the school of hard knocks, um, then went straight to the Navy. Um, as I say, very distinguished war. And so inevitably, his character is different from that of his sons, because that's the way it worked. There was never any doubt that they both loved each other very much. They would always greet each other with a hug and a kiss and to part in the same way. Now, the difference is that they would have different views on different subjects, diametrically opposed views half the time. And so therefore there would be quite a volatile discussion going on. But as someone said to me, that doesn't mean they don't like each other, it just means they disagree with each other and they would part with a kiss. And there was never any doubt that there was love between them. That love of family grew as the royal family grew. Philip lived long enough to see the arrival of eight grandchildren and see them marry. He was also able to welcome the arrival of great-grandchildren, a fourth generation of royals. Of course, the most important relationship of Prince Philip's life was with his wife, Her Majesty the Queen. And in terms of defining his contribution and legacy, it's her words that guide many. All too often, I fear Prince Philip has had to listen to me speaking. Frequently, we have discussed my intended speech beforehand. And as you will imagine, his views have been expressed in a forthright manner. <laughs> the only person's opinion that really counts here is the Queen's. And she has said more than once that she couldn't have done it without him. He said he tried to support the Queen without getting in the way. And I think, you know, on those terms, he was an incredibly successful and very important uh, consort to the Queen. And as she said, uh, we owe him a debt of gratitude more than probably we will ever know. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family and this and many other countries owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. I think the Queen was absolutely right in what she said about the Duke of Edinburgh being, being her, her strength and her stay over many years because I think that it's clear, it's almost an impossible job, the head of state, and to do so on your own, and it's, a, it's quite a lonely place. I think that the one person that she could be absolutely confident and have confidence in was her husband. And so she, he shared a lot of the difficult times um, with the Queen in, in a way that no one else could. If I had a proposal, she would often say, what does Philip think? Have you talked to him? And if I had, I would tell her. If I hadn't, I'd say, I, I haven't talked to him, uh, but would you like me to do so? And uh, she would say, yes, certainly. And once I did and came back to her with, her, with, with Prince Philip views, I can't remember any occasion where she didn't uh, uh, immediately say, well, right, go ahead. So I think he was a great um, source of, of, of both comfort, but also wise advice. And I think partly that was because he, he was a very intelligent, thoughtful man, uh, but also because he was very independent-minded. 
But after August 2017, that comfort and wise advice for the Queen came behind the scenes and not in public. At the age of 96, Prince Philip retired from public duties. Taking the salute at Buckingham Palace as Captain General of the Royal Marines was his final solo public engagement after 65 years of service. In his later years, there would still be important family matters to contend with. Less than two years after attending the wedding of Prince Harry to Meghan Markle at Windsor Castle, Philip saw his much-loved grandson withdraw from royal duties. This included Harry relinquishing his title as Captain General of the Royal Marines, a position handed to him by his grandfather. Philip's reaction would have been one of great disappointment. He'd formed a very close bond with Harry over the years. So there'd been this long link between grandfather and grandson. Philip too, his whole life has been shaped by a sense of duty, uh, supporting the monarchy, supporting the Queen, of course, first and foremost. And I think he felt that Harry was letting the side down. Philip, I know, did not approve. There were other serious challenges for the family, with his son, Prince Andrew, stepping down from royal duties over his friendship with convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. And at the age of 97, Prince Philip was involved in a car crash near Sandringham that injured a member of the public. Despite these events, the importance of the monarchy would once again come to the fore at a time of crisis, during the coronavirus outbreak. As the UK struggled with such an unprecedented emergency, Prince Charles was one of tens of thousands to be infected and spoke to the nation in a video message. Having recently gone through the process of contracting this coronavirus, luckily with relatively mild symptoms, um, I now find myself on the other side of the illness, but still in uh, no less a state of social uh, distance and, and, and general isolation. The Queen also spoke to the public and Prince Philip was with her in Windsor as she gave only her fifth unscheduled TV address to the nation. Together we are tackling this disease and I want to reassure you that if we remain united and resolute, then we will overcome it. Philip was in isolation with her at Windsor Castle where the broadcast was made. I am absolutely certain he would have cast his eye over the words that she was going to speak. The sentiment was very much the Queen's, of course, reflecting her own childhood and the epic years of the war where she has such strong memories. Um, and of course, Philip shares those memories because he was an active participant in the Second World War and the Queen was able uh, to use her own experience to frame her comments and Philip would have helped her uh, if not draft the words, he would have certainly looked at the words to, to, to give it his sort of once over, if you like. It was a moment when the monarch was able to offer some comfort, with Prince Philip giving her his support as he had done for decades. The Duke of Edinburgh even gave his own rare public statement, praising the work of those tackling coronavirus. His life as, ho as a whole was, a, was one of service, of duty, uh, of interest and, and of doing things that uh, would make the world a slightly better place. I think that that's part of his legacy is that virtually everything that he touched, uh, Prince Philip improved and added something to. It's been a, a challenge for us, but by trial and experience, I believe we have achieved a sensible division of labor and a good balance between our individual and joint interests. Of course, after 50 years of experience, I find there's a great temptation to give advice. <laughs> the trouble is that no two marriages are quite alike. However, I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. And uh, you can take it from me, that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. 
I remember going on a tour with them, and at the end of the day, it had been a very long day, the Queen and Prince Philip got into the Royal Limousine, and I was in the car behind with the Queen's private secretary and the Aquarius. And we followed them, and it was somewhere in the West Country. We're going down West Country roads, and in the car immediately in front were the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And they'd been on their feet all day. And he was jabbering away to the Queen, non-stop, and she was roaring with laughter. And it was very touching to see this elderly couple getting on so well, so famously, after all those years. Among the countless images he took of the couple, for Arthur Edwards, perhaps this one encapsulates best the bond between queen and consort, husband and wife. That was the last day of their last trip to Australia. And um, they were leaving that big barbecue in Perth to get the plane home. And the queen was trying to see as many people as possible and obviously not everybody could get the, give their flowers to the Queen and so the Duke was collecting the flowers and bringing them over to the Queen and it was that look of her, fa her face at him absolutely adoring at him and uh, taking the flowers and it was just, it says everything, that just that one look on her face and his smile and the fact that they're so connected. We have to thank God for that man. He was just a brilliant, brilliant man and he was just Perfect for the country at the time, perfect for the Queen, and, and certainly we just got to be grateful we had him. The Duke of Edinburgh served this nation during war and long years of peace. For seven decades, he supported his wife and sovereign loyally. Though never seeking commendation, Prince Philip was unquestionably the foundation upon which Her Majesty's successful reign was built. And for that, above all else, he should be remembered. men in this world who would do that. If Her Majesty became the epitome of unbroken discretion and calm, Prince Philip was, by comparison, larger than life. <laughs> and a man of strong opinions. It remains to be seen whether those in political authority can shoulder their responsibilities in time. He enjoyed getting things done, and getting things done means being outspoken. Free-thinking and direct, the Duke of Edinburgh most certainly was, but ultimately, he was also the husband, whose devotion to his wife and to his adopted nation allowed her reign to be long and successful. He has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years, and I and his whole family and this and many other countries owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know.